Okay, welcome everyone. This is the July 19th post-service discussion with us uh, to my left. <laughs> we have Reverend Stephen Landale, who just gave the service today for um, Beloved and Broken Community. So welcome, Stephen, and thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you. Good to be with you. So let's go ahead and, uh, and start. We'll, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments for Stephen? And is that, is that your beautiful fiance? This is Heather. <laughs> oh. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Let's, let's You'll meet her in person when uh, things get back to, to normal or normal-ish whenever yeah. that is. Yeah. So. Let's, let, let's give the, the two of them a, uh, a group congratulations on the <laughs> engagement. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Feel very sure. lucky. Yeah, yeah. It's very happy news. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I, I will... Uh, maybe maybe um, use my privilege to to ask the first question um you know it, i love that you reference uh jacob's wrestling with god and and you know that that the visions uh the story of jacob is something that i come back to quite a lot um in my personal life and and in my ministry as well um what do you think if anything is it significant that jacob was not a particularly noble or virtuous man. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, uh, that's true of many uh, uh, people in the Bible. I mean, David, you know, yeah. sort of had his flaws as well. And I think that's uh, something that's underappreciated. Uh, I mean, kind of the idea is that you can be a flawed person, um, and still do the right thing and still have a tremendously positive impact on others. Um, and I think that's actually ultimately reassuring. Uh, but sometimes people read these stories and, um, and then dismiss it, you know, say, well, they're all crooks or something. Yeah. <laughs> they're all cool. They're pretty far. I mean, worse than that, of course, you know, the way many of them treated women and so forth. So, um, yeah, so that, I think that's uh, the... Part of the power of the Hebrew scriptures is they're very human stories involving, you know, I mean, you know, Joseph too, you know, um, you went on to do great things at the end of the Genesis was, you know, youngest brother from hell. Yeah. <laughs> I can relate. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, most, most older brothers would respond as his older brothers did, you know, selling him into slavery, but I, I'm sure a lot would think about it. I, yeah, I'm sure a lot were tempted. <laughs> Not tempted. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I think that's actually a really important part of, part of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I agree. The way it even extends to God. I mean, I think it's Abraham who negotiates with God. God wants to wipe out an entire village. Yeah. With sins of a large number of people and one person says but would you do it if there were you know you know 50 20 kind of kind of reasons with god it makes god realize that uh destroying an entire village for the sake of a small you know one number for one person one sinner is unjust so uh, even even god learns and grows in the hebrew scriptures so, right yeah. right yeah Beautiful. Um, okay, well, opening up the floor to anybody who has a comment or a question. How do I just start talking? Yep. Okay. I am particularly moved by the story of the parents allowing their son's organs to be donated to what could be considered the enemy. Yeah, it's hard to imagine a greater enemy than the people who killed your child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's extremely moving to me. And of course, that wouldn't be in any Old Testament writings. <laughs> but that um, really shows the power of generosity and forgiveness. And um, Somebody help me with a, a word that seems fitting because I, I can't think of one right now. 
but it, it's just a very moving story. And I'm, I'm hoping that we all think of our roles in our current world and how we could perhaps do something similar and be benevolent to someone who seems opposed to what each of us might feel, do, or believe. So thank you for, very much for that story. You're welcome. I mean, I think a really good question is to say, ask yourself honestly, who do I feel hatred towards? Just honestly. Uh, who do I dismiss? And I think uh, a lot of progressives will dismiss, you know, people on the other end of the political spectrum in this country. And, you know, and I think that's good to be honest about that. Say, well, if I'm serious about applying this lesson, how can I make an act of generosity uh, toward mm -hmm. those that I hate or look down on or disrespect in any way? Well, can, can you answer that question? Can I what? Can you answer that question if you say, like, what can I do for the other side? Oh, I think it's a question we need to ask ourselves. <laughs> you know, I can't. Well, I'm I, asking it. But I, I think our family members, I, I think one is to, um, you know, in our political climate, give the gift of curiosity. You know, try to shift. The, there's a big difference between asking, why do they support Trump or why do they do this? And actually, genuinely, talking to someone in your family or someone saying, you know, I wish the question I didn't ask my brother yesterday was just visiting. <laughs> you know, he says, well, Trump's a bit of a jerk, but he's accomplished a lot. And I kind of wish to say, well, what, what is it that he's accomplished? And then not get defensive and ready to argue. Just listen and try to hear what's of stake for that person. Uh, and my hospice work has really opened me up to this. It's helped me uh, reveal my own prejudices and things because I'm there it's a great privilege. It's, people think of hospice, that you are helping people the end of their lives, but I'm also in this incredibly privileged position of being invited into people's private homes yeah. like as their pastor at a very important time and the levels of trust. So I can't bring in my prejudices and uh, I have to leave those at the door. And I've come to deeply respect and love people who I might have dismissed somewhat. And so I'd have to realize that people have strong feelings about something. There's something at stake for them. Okay. And that genuine curiosity, what's at stake, and to make a genuine effort to realize uh, that we participate in clannishness and disparaging others. And we, uh, it's a human tendency to bond with others by, on some level, making fun of other people. And, you know, liberals do that as much as conservatives do. And in some ways, it's more obnoxious, I think, because conservatives are often more open about being judgmental. <laughs> so so I, I find that really making an effort to, to be curious, give the gift of curiosity. Um, so so non, uh, Marshall Rosenberg's nonviolent communications tools are really helpful uh, in that. But I think you have to really just ask honestly, like, Let's get out of this pretend land where I don't have any negative feelings about anybody, and it's only those jerks who do. Uh, well, wait a minute, the jerks. <laughs> and then say, okay, this is my spiritual work, and not make it abstract, like, and, and then not make your, your encounter with them about making yourself feel better. But when it comes up, just listen, pause, and shut your mouth, and try to stop asking good questions. Yeah. And maybe be willing to come and see, oh, I. I kind of understand what's at stake. And maybe out of the 10 things they said, there's one I kind of agree with. Huh. Okay. You know? Okay. Um, it is. Yeah. I did. I needed to hear that. There's a portion. I will say, I, as a pastor, I've had, I've said from the pulpit, you know, if Unitarian versus congregations are non dogmatic, then you should be able to view abortion as murder and be a member of this church. Whoa, we get some response from that. And, but then some private people come up to me and say, well, I'm not that far, but I'm uncomfortable with it. And they said, I feel like, thank you. I feel like I couldn't say that here. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, to me, I feel like um, another tool is getting out of the habit of, uh, that's a big thing, 
uh, using evaluative language and try to use neutral descriptive language. So for instance, I don't refer to pro-life or pro-choice. Uh, I refer to people who support abortion rights for women or, or not. And I think that that puts it on a plane where you can talk about it. Because as soon as you make it pro-life, it's like, well, how can you be against life? And as soon as you make it pro-choice, well, who can be against choice? And as soon as you make it a women's health issue. But, but I mean, if, if you don't understand, some people look at it as life begins at conception. Well, if the person actually sees that, and, or life begins when, you know, so, I mean, I, I mean, an example on that one uh, too, you know, I had a good friend who's in liberal circles in Berkeley, she had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And she felt like she couldn't tell, get, she would start, she would refer, she said, I lost my baby mm -hmm. to her women's group in Berkeley, California. And the response was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There was this yeah. instinct for compassion, but there was a sense in this liberal group that if they acknowledged that that was the loss of a baby, that they might have to shift their politics a little bit. Mm -hmm. So my friend received less compassion because of the ingrained political position of her friends in her women's support group. So there's an example of that. I feel like areas where we're hardened and we're right. And, and I went through in my first marriage, you know, two miscarriages early and it's a little similar, not as strong. So I feel like that one, like, well, I don't agree. It's complicated, but I can see that people might see it that way and have really strong views about it. And so maybe I won't say, you know, bumper stickers, hey, Bush, stay out of mind, and all that stuff that just completely dismisses it. And I feel like looking at our contributions to the culture war, I mean, it's always look easy to see what's the other side contributing, any, any conflict. What, what are we contributing? So I feel like that kind of thing, well, where are we being? And, and you know, it's, you know, part of the reason Donald Trump is president is because people feel dismissed. They feel that their views are being completely dismissed. And I feel like that's, I see that a lot in yeah, liberal circles here in Eugene and UU congregations and most of the places I am because I'm liberal with some caveats and places where I differ a little bit, you know. Yeah. So, I'm a long answer. <laughs> no, no, but that's, but it's a good answer, you know, yeah, and um, I, I, uh, I'm quite heartened by that because uh, the very last talk that I gave to this congregation was attempting to do a conservative reading of the seven principles, you know, so, you know, in, in all of this, you're, you're speaking my language and, uh, and I really appreciate it. And I know Kim appreciates it too, even though she's muted right now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Kim, do you want to, do you want to respond to that real quick or? Uh, you're, yeah, I just asked you to unmute. So what, what am I responding to? Oh, just any, 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 any part that was said, you know, was uh, I, I just saw your head nodding a lot and thought you might have. The thing. Yeah. Yeah. With the abortion thing, I can't get past that we're killing babies. You know, I, I, I work as a, I'm a teacher and I see these young kids and I, I just, you know, when, when they start saying you're aborting a kid, that's what I think. It's a, it's a child. It's not nothing else but a child. So I have a real issue with when people go, oh, we're just, it's just for women's rights. Well, who cares what rights that we have? What, what about the baby's rights? <laughs> we're yeah. aborting a lot of them for reasons other than as a life. Okay. And when you see the babies, they look like babies. I mean, you know, they don't look butterflies or anything. They just look like little babies. It's really sad. Well, thanks for sharing. And, yeah. Really, so, you know. And I'm not here to say one side or right is the other. I just know that that's a common one in liberal circles. Like you just expressed, it is or something and, and complicated, you know. So I feel like if we're going to really so appreciate you're speaking that clearly and honestly and encourage in doing so, because by and large in UU congregations, that's just as out of bounds to say as it is in a conservative congregation mm -hmm. uh, to say I support abortion rights or you know uh, other things you know plenty of other things can be out of bounds and out of bounds in more conservative congregations. Um, 
Um, okay, so now that we've got we, we've got about seven people in here, what I'd like to do is I'll mute everybody, unmute Stephen, and then if you have a question, you can either type it into the chat or raise your hand or make a big fuss, and I'll I'll get to you next. Okay, watch watch the chat because if a lot of people want to talk, then um, that's where you'll see the lineup. Okay, agreed, everyone. Did you okay. say raise hands? Yep. I don't have that. You have two hands. <laughs> okay. All right. Hang on. Let me unmute Stephen, and then. Uh, okay. Do you want to go next, then, Sharon? Yes. Okay. I'm confused about the examples of miscarriages, and the woman not receiving compassion from her group. A miscarriage is not an abortion. No, it's not. But if you habitually um, refer to and people habitually talk about abortion in terms of a woman's health issue and uh, will never say a fetus or a baby. It, it, a woman saying, I've lost my baby, kind of makes it harder to then turn around and argue that abortion is merely a uh, health issue. It, you see what I'm saying? So it's just, it's not that she didn't receive any compassion, but it's when we get into these hardened positions and bumper sticker thinking and I'm right and they're wrong, we wind up getting to these calcified views that, that lose some nuance. So that it's, I mean, if they, they, it's a slipper, in other words, it would be a slippery slope for somebody in a calcified uh, life position to acknowledge readily, oh, you lost your baby. Because then when somebody else says um, you're choosing to like end the life of a baby when you have an abortion, they have a harder time arguing with that. It gets more complicated. Mm -hmm. It's nuanced than it would be if you just say, we're never going to say it's a baby. So anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on this one issue. But <laughs> that's, than that. Yeah, that's um, okay, though. You know, the conversation tends to go where it goes. JC had something, so. Hi, Stephen. Hello. I really, really was moved by your <clears throat> presentation this morning. Thank you. And I just finally figured out how to get in on this today. Yeah. And I'm not sure where the discussion has been. But what I know is my own experience. I am as solid as I can be about people's women's right to choose. But when I thought I was pregnant for the third time. I told my husband, no, I won't have it. I, I won't get an abortion because he had already said at the time we didn't have it available because that was a long time ago. He said, well, we can go here to, to get rid of it. And I said, no, we can't because I know I already accept that it is a life and I can't take it away. And so I was saying my own right, I can choose. But I didn't realize that I had a basis for choice that was not political. Yeah. <laughs> So I made that choice. I feel I was lucky in that it was a false thing and I didn't have the third child. But Jim was saying, from his point of view, look, we've got two kids. I can put them through college, but I can't deal. I won't have what it takes to deal with the third. And so he was saying no more. And I said, I understand that completely and I'll do what I can, but I can't have an abortion. So anyway, to me, that's how it works. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I just want to share for anybody who's joined late, it, it might have been surprised to hear, come in and hear a conversation a little bit about abortion and things. Yet, given that service didn't address that at all, really. Right. The original question put to me was, uh, I, I said something about, um, you know, we're looking at how can we live more like the Palestinian parents, uh, uh, Ishmael and uh, you know, Ali, Ali, I can't forget her first name now, 
um, in, in Palestine? How can we live more like that? And uh, my general response is to look for the areas where you might feel uh, hatred or disdain or just uh, uh, reflexively think somebody else is just wrong about something. Really be honest with yourself about that. And then come to that, that perspective or those per people with a genuine curiosity. Instead of, why do you feel that way? Why does a person feel that way? Why, why do you? And then stop and actually listen. So um, I just want to say that's where it went. And I gave, uh, I was asked for an example. And I gave one that's often people have, often people have reflexive views. Uh, and I found as a pastor that people are not comfortable sharing uh, views different than the majority. And that's on abortion. So it's an example of that. So I just wanted to add that in there. So. And, and I understand completely why you wouldn't want to make the entire conversation about abortion. But on the same time, you know, the reason that so many people have so much to say is because it's important to them. Yeah. Yeah. And, I just want to give know. people a framing. Sure. Oh. Yeah. 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 Anybody else um, share that or another? I don't need to steer it away. Just. Yeah. No. And that's, that's fine. You're, you're being so gracious by, by giving us your time and we appreciate it so much. Um, Sharon, you had your hand up, uh, but uh, Glennis also wanted to say something. Is it okay if we circle back to you? Oh, let me. I, that... I feel like what I'm going to say is directly related to what Stephen has just said. Okay, go, go for it. And as a person who experienced a true miscarriage, I had confusion about the example given mm -hmm. that I lost a baby. It's not the same thing as saying I had an abortion. <laughs> and I, I don't, yeah, I don't know how to clarify that. I'm just saying in that moment, it's not the same thing as an abortion. And I wasn't meaning to say it was. I, I don't know how to say it any clearer. So maybe we might need to move on because it's just. Uh, I'm I'm willing to move on because I don't want. Yeah, to yeah, I'm not yeah, I'm not saying it's, it's the same thing as saying you had an abortion. I'm just saying that uh, the calcified argumentative modes that we sometimes get into on a position might make it harder for us to see nuanced things. Um, and so, and that, that general pattern resulted in my friend receiving less compassion on it. And I think myself and, and uh, first wife on that too. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you for clarifying. Glennis uh, wanted to say something. Well, all I wanted to do was to supply perhaps a, a word or a concept when it comes to uh, these parents who were so kind to the, the enemy, and that is a state of grace. And if we can attain that state of grace more often when we're talking to people with whom we don't agree and who are on opposite ends of the universe for you uh, or for yourself, then... Um, uh, I think that's what we're attaining and what Stephen might be referring to. I, I could be wrong. I love that. I love that you've used the word grace there because grace is something that's both a gift. I mean, people say amazing grace, like it just comes to us. It's not our choice, but then in a way it's a choice to participate in it, to welcome yes. it or to reject it. So I'd like to put it out to you all. Have you all had an experience of that kind of grace where you just felt like, boy, you could just continue, I mean, having every right in the world. A friend of mine said in seminary, the most dangerous force in the world is uh, justified anger. I said, well, don't you mean unjustified anger? He said, oh, no, no, no. Unjustified anger doesn't have nearly the force uh, as justified anger does. Justified anger is what really leads to this murder retribution going back and forth. Everybody's justified. Um, so what have you all had an experience where you had some sense of justified anger, perhaps, and felt a sense of grace or forgiveness or a softening or shifting? Anybody have an experience like that you'd like to share? Hands up. Well, you know, uh, and, and I, I can say for sure. So, um, really for me, um, it was, it, it, it was just being through a, a tremendous period of grief and still surviving, you know, and it's like, and, and you really learn the meaning of the phrase, you know, there, but for the grace of God, you know, uh, that really coming 
face to face with a series of events that could utterly destroy you and yet you don't and yet you survive uh so that is that is my story of amazing grace mm -hmm. yeah uh gladys you wanna well mine has to do with my adoptive mother who was very very difficult um and I've come to realize on, uh, she's passed uh, quite some time ago. Before she passed, we had a discussion about it. And I suddenly realized uh, when she was continuing her usual stuff that she didn't realize, she didn't know how to talk to me uh, in any other way. She was my adoptive mother. She wanted me to be who she wanted me to be and not who I really was. So it was a constant uh, battle throughout my life. And so two, two weeks before she died, I came in and she did her thing. And I said to her, I don't think you know how to talk to me unless you're picking on me. And she, I'm sorry. And then I told her that I loved her anyway. And that's mm -hmm. the truth because recently or, or more recently than that, you know, and through the years between now and then, um, I've come to discover, um, uh, she did more good than bad. She, uh, did the best she could with who she was. And um, there were a lot of things that she did that at the time were very hurtful, but have helped me in the long run. So to me, that's part of being in a state of grace. It's, it's not that I can do that all the time, because I most certainly can't. <laughs> I'm human, but I would think that might be an example. That's lovely. So hearing some things of it, just to highlight, and please add, if I'm but some things I heard that can be kind of generalized or applied uh, were a relationship where you kind of had justified reasons for feeling hurt or disappointed um, and upset. And then somehow a conversation that was a healing or forgiveness conversation. And then also a broader perspective to accept. Not, and no, I, I didn't hear you negating the hurts uh, or the mistakes.